Hello, I'm Michelle McCory, and this is Kitco News. They are an essential component of every electronic gadget, from smartphones to refrigerators to cars, and the world is running out of them. The global shortage of chips or semiconductors is now expected to last into 2022, and unless it's addressed urgently, it could threaten the United States economy and national security. Joining me to discuss this is Matt Hayden. He's the former Assistant Secretary for Cyber Infrastructure Risk and Resilience at the Department of Homeland Security. And Matt is currently the VP of GovTech Solutions at Exeger. Matt, thank you for joining us. Happy to be here, thank you. All right, so Matt, initially this was being felt by the auto industry as cars now need more semiconductors than ever before, but it's now spreading to other industries and sectors. And people may not only have to wait for their new Chevy Malibu, but also for their iPhones, their Playstations, their laptops. So Matt, how dire and widespread is this global chip shortage? And you hit the nail right on the head, it is global. We're looking at days from 200 to past a year for specific chips that range uh, for consumer electronics to major manufacturing across the world. So clearly the pandemic and shutting down of factories around the world is a factor here, but can we blame this completely on COVID? How exactly did we get to this situation, Matt? It's a little more complicated. COVID plays a role. There's a number of complex bottlenecks that have hit here. We also have a challenge from the source of what we're making these semiconductors with, and that's the rare earth minerals challenge. All right, so we're running out of rare earth minerals. There's obviously factories being shut down because of COVID. But if tomorrow the world wakes up and we're out of chips, what does that look like? Paint me that grim and dark picture. Well, just as we've gotten used to technology saving the day and building in a large number of efficiencies, we're going to find that we have to do a lot of sit and wait for products to make it to our shelves and to our homes. For example, a new laptop that we have been looking for may take six to eight months to be delivered. Those chip shortages are going to impact every level of supply chain for the day-to-day -day work that we see and, and currently, especially from work from home, uh, take advantage of. All right, so people are going to have to learn to become a lot more patient if this isn't addressed soon. But surely on the economic side, it has bigger consequences than just this near-term pain. I mean, if this does slow down the post-pandemic recovery for certain industries, as one would assume it would, this also then feeds into inflation concerns because we've got limited supply here, high demand, higher chip costs are then going to make all the electronics more expensive stands to reason. So tell us what the economic consequences are for this in the near term and more importantly, in the long term. What we're going to find is, is prices reflective of scarcity. So we will see some increases in prices across markets that do depend on these chips just so that they can get to our shores and, and prioritize some of those items. And in the long run, we should see some leveling out. So when people reflect to this as an inflationary standard, I think it's going to follow just more of the supply and demand curve. And as we do build up those semiconductor and manufacturing options and do start to catch up, that pricing should level out. All right, but why is this being painted as a national security other than the obvious reason that, you know, you need semiconductors and everything, as we said, from cars to F-35s? But explain how severe of a national security threat this shortage could turn out to be. Everything from our information systems to our defense systems to uh, our, our sensitive electronics that we use as a government to protect the everyday citizenry has the challenge of supply if it's no longer available. It's also giving uh, nation state actors that don't necessarily have our uh, best interest in mind in that area to hold back. Uh, potentially those supplies should they choose if we don't take a strong look and start improving our domestic footprint in this area. And by nation states, I'm going to assume you mean China here because China is the biggest uh, buyer of semiconductors and it wants to now dominate chip manufacturing to be self-sufficient. Beijing saying it wants to dominate 70% of the market share. Can China do that? How likely is it that this happens? It's only likely if we let it. Uh, what we have here is, is one of those times in which we build up our abilities and partner with like countries, we can make that a different outcome. Uh, right now, the 
cost and, and incentives that China has offered for decades to bring manufacturing to their shores is just what's going to cost us in our own turn to get domestic manufacturing stood back up on our own. The partners we're finding with Japan, Southern Korea, excuse me, South Korea and others are really going to lead the way in getting our infrastructure built up in these crucial supplies. All right. So it sounds like the best interest of the U.S. is to be self-sufficient on this front, to decouple from China. That was certainly a high agenda, high on the agenda of the Trump administration. As far as the Biden administration, we do know that President Biden has says that he wants to allocate about $50 billion to boost America's semiconductor production. Is that enough? Is that going to actually move the needle here? It will from an R&D perspective. A lot of what was passed with the CHIPS Act and what is looking to be funded through some of the infrastructure options that they've got on the Hill right now is to get a jump start on our domestic production through R&D methods and really laying out a footprint and a, uh, a blueprint, if you will, on how to make America stronger uh, in this area. All right, but assuming that the majority of the production is now moved to the U.S. and the U.S. does become more independent and self-sufficient on this front, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're still in need of rare earths to make these semiconductors. And last time I checked, China controls more than 80% of the world production and supply of rare earths. So even if production moves to the U.S., doesn't it stand to reason that's still very much dependent on China for the rare earths? That is correct. Right now, we do have a challenge in sourcing rare earth materials to make these particular investments in our manufacturing supplies. Uh, there are like-minded countries that do share some of these deposits, and, and we will need to work, uh, and the Biden administration will need to work to make those arrangements and those relationships stronger so that when new deposits are able to bring to market, it's not exclusively going to China for that finishing step. What we find with rare earth minerals isn't as much that it is all sourced in China, but it's refined in China. And so that's an element that we're going to have to take a look at to try and get some of those sources outside of that region. All right. So, Matt, if the U.S. doesn't manage to get alternative supply of rare earths, and if it doesn't manage to create rare earth production and refinement here in the United States domestically, and say China doesn't want to play ball, what is the worst case scenario that you envision? It puts us in a backseat for not just innovation, but for production and, and jobs. And when we start talking about uh, losing mass jobs to this type of an outcome, uh, that, that's critical to our economy. At the same time, our innovation scale that we've led the way with will take a backseat. And so that's going to be the, the two outcomes that are in front of us on our windshield if we don't make the proper decisions now. And what are those proper decisions that need to be made right now, Matt? So there's a global uh, conversation to be had on where those partners are going to come from to support the raw, raw earth minerals and, and what we're going to call uh, our secure pipelines for those sources. At the same time, the direct investment that's going to come from the federal government into domestic sources. And that is going to be uh, through current legislation as well as through current R&D grants, like with the National Science Foundation and others. OK, but... Do you see Beijing perhaps using its leverage here with the rare earths as a political bargaining chip? At the end of the day, they're going to do what is right for them to try and get dominance in that market. We're in a chess game with them in which their defense to our offense is going to have to play out. I don't see them letting down or, or giving in on any of these conversations. I just think that they're not uh, independently alone strong enough to prevent uh, a coalition of like-minded countries to thwart their plan. All right. Well, until that all gets sorted out, as you say, global semiconductor shortage impacting a number of sectors and industries from an investor's perspective, the adage is never let a good crisis go to waste. So how do you play this as an investor? What are the potential opportunities here? 
Well, domestic companies that make semiconductors, they're going to be infused with capital. They're going to be surrounded with any amount of support from a local and federal jurisdictions. You're going to have the hand of government moving on the economic scale to make sure they're successful, because without their success, we're going to have future challenges. So if I'm an investor, I'm looking at those specific markets and I'm looking to see where their growth opportunities are with all of this new attention. And which are the domestic chip makers that you think are most likely to benefit from this influx of money? Well, we look at companies like Qualcomm and others, but there's a large amount of intellectual property holders that deal in semiconductors that also have an element here, too. So when we start talking about people who license IP just to make these semiconductors, we're talking in at scale improvement and manufacturing, and that's going to increase as well. And can you get a little bit more specific about who those IP providers are? Well, a lot of them are in the venture capital area that own a lot of the, the innovative capital, uh, excuse me, innovative IP that's come up in the past few years. I wouldn't want to name any one or two, but to the extent that we see a lot of partnerships out there that are holding uh, IP that circuits are being developed around, and that lends itself to that investment portfolio. All right, Matt. So it sounds like it's pretty dire, but it can be resolved through optimizing partnerships, both internationally and domestically. Matt Hayden, former Assistant Secretary for Cyber Infrastructure Risk and Resilience at the Department of Homeland Security. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm Michelle McQuarrie. Keep it right here.